Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome to Adventures in History. Today's topic is the 1951 Cleveland Indians ALMLB baseball season. Again, the tribe was playing in, in the American League, the junior circuit of Major League Baseball, and home games were played at Cleveland Municipal Stadium downtown. In 1951, the Tribe had an outstanding year, a tremendous year. They finished in second place with a record of 93-61, and 61, 32 games over 500, winning percentage of 604. Really good. Five games out of first. The first place team was the New York Yankees, who were 98-56, and 56, winning percentage of 636. Second place, the Cleveland Indians, 93-61. and 61. Third place, the Boston Red Sox, 87 and 67. Fourth place, the Chicago White Sox, 81 and 73. Fifth place, the Detroit Tigers, 73 and 81. Sixth place, Connie Max Philadelphia Athletics, 70 and 84. Seventh place, the Washington Senators, 62 and 92. And in eighth and last place, the St. Louis Browns, who were 52 and 102, winning percentage of 338. 46 games out of first. The try was in first place on August 13th. They had a 13-game winning streak in August. The Tribe was the first team to have three 20-game winners uh, among the pitchers on, their, on, on the team. And those guys were Bob Feller, Early Wynn, and Mike Garcia. All won 20, 20 games in 1951. First time this had happened in MLB since the 1931 Philadelphia Athletics. Attendance for the tribe in 1951 was 1,704,984, or 22,000 fans per game. 1951 was the 50th anniversary of the start of the American League, the beginning of the American League, and uh, the the Indians decided to establish their own Hall of Fame, a tribe Hall of Fame. And uh, those who were inducted included Cy Young, Mel Harder, Steve O'Neill, Hal Trotsky, Napoleon Lajouet, Joe Sewell, Ken Keltner, Tris Speaker, Earl Averill, Shulis and Shulis Joe Jackson. And the, there was a physical Hall of Fame inside the stadium on the concourse, first base side. And so fans could come see, the, see this. Uh, the inductions were discontinued in the 1970s. In 1951, Bill Vack was the owner of the St. Louis Browns, former tribe owner, and on August 19th, he had a uh, midget uh, named Eddie Gadel, whom he signed for, to a contract, who, who batted in a game uh, in St. Louis against the Tigers and walked on four pitches. And after that, uh, Eddie Gadel and was banned from MLB. Uh, Gadel developed a drinking problem and, and was murdered in Chicago in 1961 at age 36. He was beaten up and had a heart attack. Now, the, the pitcher for the Tigers, who, who had to face uh, Eddie Gadel uh, and threw those four balls, uh, was Bob, Bob Keane, who settled in Cleveland. And Cleveland sports writer uh, Dan Coglin interviewed Keane about that experience of pitching to Eddie Gadel. And Coglin said, quote, He was unfailingly gracious and, and enjoyed reminiscing about it. Spring training of 1951, the Tribe had an exhibition game against the New York Yankees. The Yankees had this uh, hot, hot, hot rookie, Mickey Mantle, who did not know how to work the flip, flip down sunglasses that the players have when, in case there's a fly ball and the sun gets in their eye. So there was a Ray Boone hit a fly ball in this game, and Mantle was un, wasn't able to get the sunglasses down, and the ball hit him over the left eye on his head. I'm reading, reading a fine book. The title is Mickey Mantle, America's Prodigal Son by Tony Castro, 2002. Now, a little Yankee history. Babe Ruth had number three. Lou Gehrig was number four. Joe DiMaggio, number five. And Mantle was given number six in 1951. Vinnie Castro wrote, quote, Mickey Mantle's 1951 spring training was something out of a fairy tale. Mantle said, quote, I was a classic country bumpkin who came to New York City carrying a cardboard suitcase and with a wardrobe of two pairs of slacks and a pastel-colored sports coat. Early in the season, Mantle was leading the American League in average RBIs and home runs and then had a slump, and in July was sent to Kansas City in the minor leagues, the Kansas City Blues. Mantle said, quote, I had been a Yankee, and now I was nothing. I was always one of those guys who took all of the bad luck doubly hard, 
who saw disaster when there was just everyday trouble, and who took every slump as if it were a downhill slide to oblivion. And then in Kansas City at AAA, he did not hit. He went 0 for 19 and decided to quit. He called his father, who came to, who came to Kansas City, and his father said, quote, Well, Mick, if that's all the guts you have, I think you better quit. You might as well come home right now. Come on back to Commerce, Oklahoma, and grub out a living in the mines for the rest of your life. I thought I raised a man, not a coward. Mantle said that his father's words were the greatest thing his father ever did for him and, quote, put iron into my spine when it was needed most. So he stayed in Kansas City and he started hitting. The same day he hit two home runs and the next 41 games at Kansas City he hit 361, 11 home runs and 50 RBIs and by August was uh, brought back to the Yankees and given a new number, number seven. His uh, very good friend was Billy Martin on the Yankees and fr- Martin was friends with Joe DiMaggio, who did not have, who had, whom, for whom Martin was his only friend. Back with the Yankees, Mantle hit 283, and he was groomed as Joe DiMaggio's re- replacement, who was, this was his, DiMaggio's last year, and was booed by, Mantle was booed by DiMaggio fans. I'm reading another fine book. The title is Willie Mays, The Life, The Legend, The Legend by James S. Hirsch, 2010. In 1950, Mays was in the Negro Leagues playing for the Birmingham Black Barons, but was signed by the New York Giants and sent to Trenton to the, the Trenton Giants in Class B in the Interstate League. He was the first black in that league and hit 353. Willie Mays was very gregarious and popular with his teammates in Trenton in the minors. In, the, in 1951, he was in AAA with the, with the AAA Minneapolis Millers and roommates with the uh, uh, two black players, Dave Barnhill and Ray Dandridge, who was a Negro League legend. And in 35 games, Mays hit 477 and was called up to the Giants in 1951. James S. Hirsch wrote, quote, The Giants needed a headliner, a savior, someone who would restore the glory of a dynasty. So both Mickey Mantle and Willie Mays were rookies in 1951. Mays had power, speed, he, had a, he could hit home runs, and he could run, and he had, had, a, had a tremendous throwing arm. His first home run at the Polo Grounds in New York, the crowd roared. And Robert Creamer wrote, quote, All that the crowd was saying really was, Welcome, Willie. We've been waiting for you all our lives. James S. Hirsch wrote, quote, Willie May's rookie year would not be his finest or the year of his greatest celebrity, but it was his sunburst, creating a perception of athleticism, innocence, and joy that would shape the public's view, view for many years. Now, May, Willie Mays uh, started one for 26, had a tough start. He was 038, and after uh, after the final game, uh, he was crying in, in the locker room. And Leo DeRocher, the manager of the Giants, came, and Mays said, "Quote, Mr. Leo, I can't help you. I can't even get a hit. I know I can't play up here." and you're going to send me back to Minneapolis. That's where I belong. And Leo DeRocher responded, quote, You're going to be a great ball player. You're the best center fielder I've ever looked at. You're going to get plenty of hits. And so this was the, uh, he started hitting, and that was the end of the slump. DeRocher and Mays had a wonderful relationship, also kind of a father-son relationship. Mays played the shallowest center field since Chris Speaker for the Tribe and was a very aggressive outfielder. In, in coming in and getting balls and trying to throw out base runners. Arnold Hanno wrote that Mays, quote, Mays, quote, had revolutionized outfield play. Outfielders today must be shortstops in their approach to ground ball base hits. He got the nick- Mays got the nickname the Say Hey Kid. Leo DeRocher said, quote, he electrified the clubhouse. When he came in, all eyes were on him. The other players would make jokes around him, and Willie would laugh in that tenor voice, and suddenly everyone would feel good and know that our team had no more worries. Teammate Monty Irvin said, quote, Willie gave me a lift. You always knew when he was around, because the love of life, the love of life just flowed out of him, and it got to the point where it was a pleasure to come to the ballpark every day. The single greatest factor in our pennant run, beyond a shadow of a doubt, was the presence of Willie Mays. He just made it better for everybody. Now, popular 1951 movies included An American in Paris with Gene Kelly, The African Queen with Humphrey Bogart, 
and a streetcar named Desire with Marlon Brando. And there was a new television show in 1951, I Love Lucy, starring Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. Now again, the, tri- the, the head of the tribe ownership group in 1951 was Ellis Ryan, who was the principal who was the principal tribe owner from 1950 to 1952, Ellis Ryan. Hank Greenberg was back as general manager, and Greenberg was the tribe GM from 1950 to 1957. In 1950, Greenberg replaced the popular but ineffective Catholic third baseman, Ken Keltner, with the Jewish Al Rosen, and a lot of tribe fans were unhappy. This was a good move because uh, Keltner was at the end of his career, and and uh, was ineffective, and Rosen became a star. However, there was a lot of anti-Hank Greenberg sentiment because he was Jewish, and um, Rosen was Jewish, and anti-Semitism was a real real problem. Greenberg told Al Rosen to ignore the anti-Semitic insults and play to the best of his ability. Hank Greenberg. Jack Graney was back as the tribe radio broadcaster on WERE 1300 radio, and Graney was... Played for the Cleveland Naps and Cleveland Indians in 1908 and from 1910 to 1922 and was the tribe radio broadcaster from 1932 to 1953, Jack Graney. His partner on the radio was Jimmy Dudley at WERE 1300 and Dudley, Dudley was a tribe radio broadcaster from 1948 to 1968, Jimmy Dudley. Hal Newell was the tribe t- television broadcaster on WXEL television and he was the Tribe TV broadcaster just in 1951, Hal Newell. Now, the coaching staff included a new coach, Jake Flowers, who was a Tribe coach in 1951 and 1952. Flowers was born in 1902 in Cambridge, Maryland, and died in 1962 in Clearwater, Florida, at age 60. During his playing career, he batted 256 with 16 home runs and 201 RBIs. Flowers played for the St. Louis Cardinals, Brooklyn Rob- Robins, Brooklyn Dodgers, and Cincinnati Reds from 1923 to 1934. He won two World Series titles with the St. Louis Cardinals in 1926 and 1931. Flowers was an infielder who played second base and shortstop. During his career, he played 583 games. He went to Washington College and played on the football, basketball, and baseball teams there. In 1937, he was the Sporting News Minor League Manager of the Year for the Salisbury Indians. Later, he was an MLB coach for the Pittsburgh Pirates and Boston Braves and was a general manager in the minor leagues for the Boston Braves for the Milwaukee Brewers. He also worked as a scout for the Baltimore Orioles and died of a fatal heart attack. Now, he went to... Went to, he's in the Washington College and the Eastern Shore Baseball's Baseball Hall, Foundation Halls of Fame. In the minor leagues, he played for the Buffalo Bisons, Cambridge Canners, Fort Smith Twins, Jersey City Skeeters, Oakland Oaks, and Minneapolis Millers. Jake Flowers. Mel Harder was back as the pitching coach. Harder played for the Tribe from 1928 to 1947, was the Tribe pitching coach from 1946 to 1963. He threw out the first pitch at Cleveland Municipal Stadium in 1932 and the last ceremonial pitch at the stadium in 1993. Mel Harder. Bill Loeb was another new coach. Uh, Loeb was a tribe coach from 1951 to 1956. He was born in 1912 and died in 1969 at age 56. He had three years playing in the minor leagues for the, the, for the Cleveland Indians organization and also with the Chicago Cubs and hit 199. He was a catcher, hit Five foot nine, one hundred and seventy eight pounds. Loeb had military service in the Second World War. He was a bullpen and batting practice catcher and a bullpen coach. He worked for managers Lou Boudreau, Al Lopez, Kirby Farrell, Bobby Bragan, and Joe Gordon. In the minor leagues, he played for the Springfield Indians, Thomasville Tommies, Warren Buckeyes, and the Zanesville Cubs. Bill Loeb. Red Ruffing was another new coach, and Ruffing was a tribe coach only in 1951. He was born in 1905 in Granville, Illinois, and died in 1986 in Mayfield Heights, Ohio, at age 80. He was a he was a pitcher and won 273 games, lost 225 with an ERA of 3.80 and 1,987 strikeouts. Tremendous playing career. Uh, Ruffing played for the Boston Red Sox, New York Yankees, and Chicago White Sox from 1924 to 1947. He was a six-time All-Star in 1934 and from 1938 to 1942. 
He won six World Series titles in 1932, 1936 to 39, and in 1941, all with the Yankees. He was the American League wins leader in 1938, American League strikeout leader also in 1938. He's in the Boston Red Sox Hall of Fame, and he's a Monument Park honoree with the New York Yankees. He was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1967. Ruffing dropped out of school as a child to work in a coal mine in Illinois, and he played on the Mine Company baseball team. He lost four toes in a mining accident and couldn't, could not run well in the field, so switched from the outfield to become a pitcher, who, pitchers who, who don't have to run very much, and became a Yankees ace. He was a bullpen coach with the White Sox and a pitching coach for the New York Mets. He was also a scout and a minor league instructor for the tribe. His parents were immigrants from Germany, and his father was a coal miner. His father had a broken back in, in, in a mining accident and became a superintendent of the mine and also mayor of Colton, Illinois. At age 13, Ruffing quit school to work in, in, a, in a coal mine, making $3 a day. His cousin died in a mine accident. His left foot was crushed when two, two mine cars collided and lost four toes. His, the doctor did save his foot. For the Red Sox... Playing for the Red Sox for five years, he was 39 and 93, winning percentage of 289. Pretty tough. He's the first pitcher in MLB history to win a game one to nothing and hit hit a hit a home run to win the game and have and have 10 strikeouts in that game. Ruffing was in the U.S. Army in the Second World War. From 1952 to 1961, he was a player personnel executive for the tribe. ESPN.com ranked Ruffing ninth greatest Yankee of all time. What a career for Red Ruffing. Al Lopez was the tribe manager, uh, was the new tribe manager. He played for the tribe in 1947. Lopez was the tribe manager from 1951 to 1956. New manager Wes Singletary said, quote, Al Lopez's success inspired others to consider him a living reputation, refutation of, of Leo DeRocher's postulate, nice guys finish last. Al Lopez felt that scolding or shouting at players only embarrassed them and hurt their confidence. From 1949 to 1964, the New York Yankees won every American League pennant except two, and both times Al Lopez was the manager of the 54 Tribe and the 59 White Sox. Marshall Smith said this about Casey Stengel, the Yankees manager, quote, Every time he looks over his shoulder, he sees the same relentless, inescapable figure. He's always there following. The pursuer is not a glamorous hero, but a doleful, threadbare man wearing a big sombrero. Alfonso Ramon Lopez never gives up. Now the tribe lineup, Jim Hegan was the catcher. Hegan batted 238 with 99 hits. He scored 60 runs, 17 doubles, 5 triples, 6 home runs, 43 RBIs, 38 walks in 133 games. And Hegan was a tribe player from 1941 to 1942 and from 1946 to 1957. Jim Hegan. Luke Easter was at first base. Easter batted 270 with 131 hits. He scored 65 runs, 12 doubles, 5 triples, 27 home runs, 103 RBIs, 37 walks, and 128 games. And, and Easter was with Cleveland from 1949 to 1954. An outstanding year for Luke Easter. Bobby Avila was at second base. Avila batted 304 with 165 hits, 76 runs, 21 doubles, 3 triples, 10 home runs, 58 RBIs, 14 stolen bases, 60 walks in 141 games. And Avila was, was with Cleveland from 1949 to 1958. On June 20th in Boston, Avila had three home runs in one game, in a game the Tribe won 14-8. Bobby Avila. Ray Boone was at shortstop. Boone batted 233 with 127 hits. He scored 65 runs, 14 doubles, 13 triples, 12 home runs, 51 RBIs, five stolen bases, 48 walks, and 151 games. And Boone was with Cleveland from 1948 to 1953. The father of Bob Boone and grandfather of Brett Boone and Aaron Boone. Ray Boone. Al Rosen was at third base. Rosen batted 265 with 152 hits, 82 runs, 30 doubles, a triple, 24 home runs, 102 RBIs. Seven stolen bases, 85 walks in 154 games. And Rosen was with Cleveland from 1947 to 1956. An outstanding year for Al Rosen. 
Dale Mitchell was in left field. Mitchell batted 290 with 148 hits, 83 runs, 21 doubles, 7 triples, 11 home runs, 62 RBIs, 7 stolen bases, 53 walks in 134 games. And Mitchell was with Cleveland from 1946 to 1956. Dale Mitchell. Larry Doby was in center field. Doby batted 295 with 132 hits. 84 runs, 27 doubles, 5 triples, 20 home runs, 69 RBIs, 4 stolen bases, 101 walks in 134 games. Doby was with Cleveland from 1947 to 1955 and in 1958 and was the Tribe coach in 1974. Boston uh, Red Sox star Ted Williams encouraged Larry Doby. Williams biographer Ben Bradley Jr. wrote, quote, Ted Williams would go out of his way to make Larry Doby feel welcome, offering hitting tips around the batting cage and chatting with him. Larry Doby said, quote, He just gave me a feeling of being welcome, which was important to me, especially when you had a lot of other people not saying anything. Didn't have to make a big deal out of it. That's why I feel it was from the heart. Doby was in the 1951 All-Star Game. On June 23rd, they ha- Larry Doby Day was held at Yankee Stadium for his friends from Patterson, New Jersey. And a gift of $1,500 was given to Doby, which meant he could burn his mortgage. He also received gifts of clothing, luggage, jewelry, a desk lamp, flowers for, for his wife Helen and his mother. The tribe did... The tribe did not win the pennant. He, the tribe did not win the pennant in, in 19, the American League pennant in 1951. And Franklin Whitey Lewis wrote an article blaming Doby. Joseph Thomas Moore, Doby biographer, wrote, quote, "One of the most destructive articles ever to vilify a professional American athlete." So this was very unfortunate. Uh, you know, the, the athletes fail, and this. My opinion was a failure by Cleveland sports writer Whitey Lewis. Anyway, tremendous year for Larry Doby. Bob Kennedy was in right field, and Kennedy batted 246 with 79 hits. He scored 30 runs, 15 doubles, 4 triples, 7 home runs, 29 RBIs, 4 stolen bases, 34 walks in 108 games. And Kennedy was with Cleveland from 1948 to 1954. Bob Kennedy. Now, the bench players included Harry Simpson, who was a utility player. Simpson batted 229 with 76 hits. He scored 51 runs, 7 doubles, 7 home runs, 24 RBIs, 6 stolen bases, 45 walks, and 122 games. Simpson was an outfielder for his baseman. He was born in 1925 in Atlanta, Georgia, and died in 1979 in Akron, Ohio at age 53. For his career, he batted 266 with 73 home runs and 381 RBIs. Simpson played for the Cleveland Indians, Kansas City Athletics, New York Yankees, Chicago White Sox, and Pittsburgh Pirates from 1951 to 1959. He was an all-star in 1956. They called him Suitcase. He was African-American. He won, Amer- he won an American League title in 1957 with the Yankees. Casey Stengel called him the best defensive right fielder in the American League. Now, this nickname, Suitcase, came from two possible sources. He was frequently traded, and that's a misconception, there was a he got the nickname from sports writers. There was a Tony Tonyville trolley newspaper comic strip with a character suit, suitcase Simpson who had a size 13 shoe as large as a suitcase. Apparently, this is how he got his nickname. He was also called Goody because of, by his because of his willingness to run errands for his neighbors in Dalton, Georgia. And so again, the character now the character Luther Suitcase Simpson in the Jesse Stones novels. Made for TV movies, Arthur Robert, Ro- author Robert B. Parker nicknamed uh, the, the character Suitcase uh, because of their, a fourth grade gym teacher, because of, because of Harry Simpson. In Mexico, Simpson played f- for the Diablos Rojos de Mexico in the minor leagues for the San Diego Padres, the Wilkes Bar Barons, and in Venezuela for Sabios de Vargas. Harry Simpson. Sam Chapman played some outfield. Chapman batted 228 with 56 hits. He scored 24 runs, 9 doubles, a triple, 6 home runs, 36 RBIs, 3 stolen bases, 27 walks in 94 games. Chapman was born in 1916 in, in Tiburon, California, and died in 2006 in Kentfield, California at age 90. 
For his career, he batted 266 with 180 home runs and 773 RBIs. Really good. Chapman played for the Philadelphia Athletics from 1938 to 1941 and from 1945 to 1951 and with Cleveland in 1951. He was an all-star in 1946. He's in the Philadelphia Baseball Wall of Fame and also the University of California at Berkeley. He played on the football team and was halfback. A college football, he's in the College Football Hall of Fame, inducted in 1984. He was a 1937 All-American playing football. 1938, he was in the Rose Bowl and was and played on a team that won the last UC Rose Bowl title. He was also a, he played center field. He led the American League in putouts four times. At he played for the as I said the the UC Golden Bears. They called him Sleepy Sam because of his stolid temperament and t- the Tiber on Terror. He was drafted in the third round of the NFL draft in 1938 by the Washington Redskins, but did not play in the NFL. In the Second World War, he was a U.S. Navy pilot and flight instructor. After he retired, he was in the inspector of the Bay Area Pollution Control District. He's in the Bay, Bay Area Sports Hall of Fame, inducted in 1987. As an older man, he developed Alzheimer's disease. In the minor leagues, he played for the Oakland Oaks, Sam Chapman. Bertie Tebbets was a spare catcher. Tebbets batted 263 with 36 hits. He scored eight runs, had six doubles, two home runs, 18 RBIs, eight walks, and 55 games. Tebbets was born in 1912 in Burlington, Vermont, and died in 1999 in Bradenton, Bench, Florida, at age 86. For his career, he batted 270 with 38 home runs and 469 RBIs. As a manager, he won 748 games, lost 705 for a winning percentage of 515. He played for the Detroit Tigers, Boston Red Sox, and Cleveland Indians from 1936 to 1952 and was a manager for the Cincinnati Redlegs, Milwaukee Braves, and Cleveland Indians from 1954 to 1966. He was the tribe manager from 1963 to 1966. Tebbets was a four-time All-Star, 1941, 42, 48, and 49. He was the best catcher in the American League in the late 1940s. Tebbets lacked speed, he lacked power, but he was exceptional as a defensive catcher and very intelligently directed to pitchers. He was 14 years as a catcher and 11 years as a manager, 28 years as a scout. Now, the nickname Birdie got from his aunt, who said his voice sounded like a bird chirping. Tebbets went to Providence College and was an All-American baseball player and got a degree in philosophy. 1940, he won an American League title with the Tigers. 1940 was a in 1940, in Cleveland, at the stadium, a basket of tomatoes was dropped on him from the upper deck when he was in the bullpen. Tebbets was in the U.S. Army Air Corps in the Second World War. Before Carlton Fisk arrived, Tebbets was voted the Red Sox all-time greatest catcher in a fan poll. He played four years for the Red Sox. 1956, he was manager. He was the manager of the year for the Cincinnati Reds. In 1957, he was on the cover of Time magazine. In 1964, as tribe manager, he had a heart attack in spring training and was out three months. He also worked as a scout for the New York Mets, New York Yankees, Baltimore Orioles, and Florida Marlins. Reggie Jackson got um, Reggie Jackson gave Tebbets credit for Tebbets' sp- uh, scouting report that helped Jackson hit three home runs in Game 7 of the 19, 1977 World Series. 1986, Tebbets won the M.L. Fuchs Award. Uh, for long meritorious service to baseball. Tebbets helped, an, um, helped, there was an umpire he helped who had, was having dizzy spells. This umpire returned from the Second World War and needed help on, on calling balls and strikes and asked Tebbets for help, and Tebbets gave hand signals. In 2009, he was a, con, rank, considered a local legend in Nashua, New Hampshire, Bertie Tebbets. Snuffy Sternweiss played some second base. Sternweiss batted 216 with 19 hits. He scored 10 runs, had a double, a home run, four RBIs, a stolen base, 22 walks, and 50 games. Sternweiss was born in 1918 in New York, New York, and died in 1958 in Newark Bay, New Jersey, at age 39. For his career, he batted 268 with 29 home runs and 281 RBIs. Sternweiss played for the New York Yankees, St. Louis Browns, and Cleveland Indians from 1943 to 1952. He was a two-time All-Star in 1945 and 46 with the Yankees and won three World Series titles in 1943, 47, and 49 with the Yankees. 
Stern Weiss was the American League batting champion in 1945 and two-time American League stolen base leader in 44 and 1945. Stern, Stern Weiss went to Fordham Preparatory School in the Bronx and led his school to his high school team to, t- to titles in baseball and basketball and football. He's in the Hall of Honor at the uh, he was in the Hall of Honor at his high school graduation. He went to the University of North Carolina and played on the football and baseball teams. Was a quarterback, halfback, and punter on the football team. Was drafted by the Chicago Cardinals in the 1940 NFL draft, but did not play in the NFL. 1947 World Series, his on-base percentage was 429, really good. He was a manager in the minor leagues for the Yankees. In 1958, he was a passenger on a railroad in New York City, and the train went through went through signals and went off an open Newark Bay, the, the, the open Newark Bay lift bridge and the train plunged into, the, into Newark Bay, killing 47 passengers, including Sternweiss. Very tragic. The minor leagues, he played for the Newark Bears and Norfolk Tars. Snuffy Sternweiss. Barney McCoskey plays some outfield. McCoskey batted 213 with 13 hits. He scored eight runs, had three doubles, Two RBIs, a stolen base, eight walks in 31 games. McCoskey was born in 1917 in Coal Run, Pennsylvania, and died in 1996 in Venice, Florida at age 79. For his career, he batted 312 with 24 home runs and 397 RBIs. McCoskey played for the Detroit Tigers, Philadelphia Athletics, Cincinnati Reds, and Cleveland Indians from 1939 to 1953. He was the last of nine children. His mother died when he was one year old. At age four, he moved to Detroit, Michigan, to live with his older brother during the Great Depression. McCoskey said, quote, Nobody had any money. We took mustard sandwiches and ketchup sandwiches to school. The Second World War, he had three years in the U.S. Navy. He lost three prime baseball years. He was a six-time considerer for the American League MVP from 1939 to 42 and from 1947 to 48. McCoskey is in the National is in the National Polish Sports Hall of Fame, inducted in 1995. After he retired, he operated a party store in Detroit and was a car salesman on the west side of Detroit. In 1957, a little league in the Detroit area was named after him, Barney McCoskey. Merle Combs played some shortstop. Combs made a 179 with five hits. He scored two runs, had two doubles, two RBIs, two walks in 19 games. Combs was born in 1919 in Los Angeles, California and died in 1981 in Riverside, California, at age 61. For his career, he batted 202 with two home runs and 25 RBIs. Combs played for the Boston Red Sox, Washington Senators, and Cleveland Indians from 1947 to 1952. He was a backup shortstop in his career. He went to the University of Southern California. In 1975, he was a coach for the Texas Rangers and was a longtime scout for the Mets, Phillies, and Reds. In the minor leagues, he played for the Columbus Redbirds, the Greensboro Red Sox, the Louisville Colonels, Oakland Oaks, San Diego Padres, San Francisco Seals, Scranton Red Sox, and Seattle Rainiers. Merle Combs. Minnie Minoso played some first base. Minoso batted 429 with six hits and 14 at bats. He scored three runs, had two doubles, two RBIs, a walk in eight games. Minoso was with Cleveland in 1949 and, and, and then in 1951, and from 1958 to 1959. He was traded to the Chicago White Sox on April 30th. This was a bad trade because Minoso became a star for the White Sox. Regarding the 1951 tribe, Minoso said, quote, Al Lopez spoke some Spanish, Spanish, which made things a little easier and a bit more comfortable for me. Yet I did not speak to Lopez in Spanish. I was in America and my job was to speak English. In a game in April, Bob Lemon was on the mound, and Minoso was at, on first, at first base. It was the ninth inning, uh, two out. Minoso was playing first. There was a ball hit to Lemon, and he made a bad throw to first. Minoso, Minoso scooped the ball out of the dirt, and, uh, which won, it got the last out. And, it, and if not, the game would have been tied because there was a runner on third. Minoso said, quote, Don't worry about it, Bob. I'm Lou Gehrig in Technicolor. Minoso was a black Cuban. Minoso said, quote, I had friends in Cleveland, a feeling of belonging that I could never find elsewhere. I was able to pal around with Luke Easter and Larry Doby. Everything about Cleveland Municipal Stadium looked good to me. The infield, the design, the lakefront, and the capacity to hold so many fans. I would be one of the last guys to leave the clubhouse. 
There would be kids outside wanting autographs. I never refused. Baseball was my life, and it had been so since I was a boy. So I never forgot how important we were to those kids. They would follow me, follow me from the ballpark to downtown Cleveland. Sometimes I'd sit with them and talk. Now, after he was traded, Minosa was shocked and very upset. He said, quote, Cleveland had become my surrogate family. I was hurt, very hurt, and disappointed. I thought my life had ended. Little did I know that a new and wonderful life was just about to begin. I would be the first black to play Major League Ball in Chicago. There were, there were, more, there were more than a few tears. I felt, I felt lost and didn't know what to do. Ray Boone knocked on my door. I'll never forget his words. You are going to have a, have a chance to play in Chicago, and the people are going to like you right away. You are a very good ball player, and this is going to help your career. Minnie Minoso. Paul Leonard played some outfield. Leonard batted 231 with three hits. He scored in 13 at bats. He scored two runs, had an RBI, a walk, and 12 games. Leonard was born in 1920 in Dolomite, Alabama and died in 1967 in Birmingham, Alabama, at age 47. For his career, he batted 257 with 22 home runs and 197 RBIs. Leonard played for the St. Louis Browns, Philadelphia Athletics, Chicago White Sox, Cleveland Indians, and Boston Red Sox. From 1946 to 1952, they called him Peanuts and Gulliver. He was one of the, he was one of the few players to play on four teams in one season. In 1951, with the Philadelphia Philadelphia Athletics, the Chicago White Sox, St. Louis Browns, and the Indians. He believed it, at one point he believed it was it was not he did he didn't believe he could play safely on Sunday. He approached he approached the trainer on his team who gave him pills. He hit a home run and never was afraid to play on Sunday again. In the minor leagues, Leonard played for the Memphis Chickasaws, Oakland Oaks, and Toledo Mud Hens. Paul Leonard. Clarence Mattern played some outfield. Mattern batted 167 with two hits and 12 at-bats. Struck out once in 11 games. Mattern was born in 1921 in Lowell, Arizona, and died in 1986 in Tucson, Arizona at age 64. For his career, he batted 248 with five home runs and 29 RBIs. Mattern played for the Chicago Cubs and Cleveland Indians from 1946 to 1951. So this was the end of his playing career. The minor leagues, he played in the minors from 1940 to 1957. Mattern went to the University of Arizona and played on the baseball team. He was in the U.S. Army in the Second World War, served in France, and was at the Battle of the Bulge. 1947 in the Pacific Coast League, playing for the Los Angeles Angels. There's a game, there's a game that Los Angeles Angels and the San Francisco Seals were tied at the end of the season. There was a one-game playoff and a sellout crowd in L.A. Wrigley Field. Scoreless in the eighth inning, Mattern had a grand slam to help the Angels win the P- PCL t- a pennant uh, in that game 5 to nothing. After he retired, he was an insurance agent. In the minor leagues, he played for the Miami Marlins, Portland Beavers, San Diego Padres, Tulsa Oilers, Vancouver Capilanos, and the San Francisco Seals. Clarence Mattern. Ali Clark played some outfield. Clark batted 300 with three hits and 10 at-bats. He scored three runs, had two doubles, a home run, three RBIs, a walk, and three games. Clark was with Cleveland was with Cleveland from 1948 to 1951. This was the end of his time in Cleveland. His MLB career continued until 1953. Allie Clark. Hal Narragon was a spare catcher. Narragon batted 250 with two hits and eight at bats. He had a walk in three games. Narragon was born in 1928 in Zanesville, Ohio. He's still alive at age 90 today. For his career, he batted 266 with six home runs and 87 RBIs. He played for the Cleveland Indians, Washington Senators, and Minnesota Twins from 1951 to 1962. He went to Barberton, Ohio High School. He caught one inning for the Tribe in the 1954 World Series. He won an American League title with Cleveland in 1954. After he retired, he was a bullpen coach for the Minnesota Twins and Detroit Tigers. And 1965 won an American League title with the Twins as a coach. And in 1968, a World Series title with the Tigers as a coach. In the minors, he played for the Pittsfield Electrics and San Diego Padres. Hal Narragon. Milt Nielsen played some outfield. He also pinch hit and pinch run. Nielsen batted six times, did not have a hit, scored a run, had a walk, struck out once in 16 games. And Nielsen was with Cleveland in 1949 and 1951. 
Milt Nielsen. Luke Klein batted twice, did not have a hit, struck out once in two games. Klein was born in 1918 in New Orleans, Louisiana, and died in 1976 in Materi, Louisiana, at age 57. He was a second baseman, shortstop, and manager during his career. He batted 259 with 16 home runs and 101 RBIs. As a manager, he was 65 and 82, winning percentage of 442. He played for the St. Louis Cardinals, Cleveland Indians, and Philadelphia Athletics from 1943 to 1951. He was a manager for the Chicago Cubs in 1961, 1962, and 1965. He won a World Series title in 1943 with the Cardinals. In 1946, he jumped to the Mexican League and was suspended by MLB for five years, but later the suspension was reduced. In the Second World War, he was in the U.S. Coast Guard. 1961, he with the Cubs, they had a college of coaches. The manager was rotated among the coaches, and he was part of that. In the minor leagues, he played for the Des Moines Bruins, Fort Worth Cats, Lafayette Oilers, New Orleans Pelicans, and in Mexico, for Azules de Veracruz and the Sultanes de Monterrey, Luke Klein. Ray Murray was a spare catcher. Murray batted 1,000. He batted once, had a hit, and one RBI in one game, and Murray was with Cleveland in 1948, and from 1950 to 1951. This was the end of his time in Cleveland. His MLB career continued until 1954. Ray Murray. Thurman Tucker batted once, did not have a hit. He struck out in one game, and Tucker was with Cleveland from 1948 to 1951. This was the end of his MLB career. Thurman Tucker. Doug Hanson was a pinch runner. He did not bat, scored two runs in three games. Hanson was born in 1928 in Los Angeles, California, and died in 1999 in Orem, Utah, at age 70. During his for his MLB career, he, he, he this was it was just with Cleveland in 1951. The minors he played 727 games for the Buffalo Bisons, Dallas Eagles, El Paso Texans, Little Rock Travelers, Vesalia Cubs, and Wilkes Bar Barons. And he went to John C. Fremont High School. Doug Hansen. Now the pitching staff was anchored by the by the ace pitcher Early Win, who was twenty and thirteen with an ERA of three point oh two. Thirty seven games, thirty four starts, twenty one complete games, three shutouts to save, two hundred and seventy four and a third inning innings pitch, and one hundred and thirty three strikeouts. Win batted one eighty five with twenty hits, he scored eight runs, had eight doubles, a triple, a home run, thirteen RBIs, seven walks, and forty one games. And Wynn was with Cleveland from 1949 to 1957, and in 1963, early Wynn. Bob Lemon was 17-14 with an ERA of 3.52, 42 games, 34 starts, 17 complete games, a shutout, two saves, 263 in a third innings, pitched in 132 strikeouts. Lemon batted 206 with 21 hits, he scored 11 runs, had four doubles, a triple, three home runs, 13 RBIs, nine walks, 20... And struck out 22 times in 56 games, and Lemon was with Cleveland from 1941 to 1942, and from 1946 to 1958, Bob Lemon. Mike Garcia was 20 and 13 with an ERA of 3.15, 47 games, 30 starts, 15 complete games, a shutout, six saves, 254 innings pitched, and 118 strikeouts. Garcia batted 212 with 18 hits. He scored three runs, had four doubles, a triple. A home run, nine RBIs, three walks, and struck out 12 times. And Garcia was with Cleveland from 1948 to 1959. Mike Garcia. Bob Feller was 22-8 and eight with an ERA of 3.50. 33 games, 32 starts, 16 complete games, four shutouts, 249 and two-thirds innings pitched, and 111 strikeouts. Feller batted 123 with 10 hits. He scored 10 runs at a double, three RBIs, eight walks, and struck out 36 times. Feller was, was, was with Cleveland from 1936 to 1941 and from 1945 to 1956 and was a Tribe Goodwill Ambassador till the end of his life. On July 1st at Cleveland Municipal Stadium, Bob Feller tied Cy Young by getting his third no-hitter in a win a victory against Detroit 2-1. He was the Sporting News Pitcher of the Year. Feller said, quote, I was always in top shape. In fact, I used to get kidded about it, even ridiculed. I worked I worked out with, with weights and barbells and did stretching exercise 25 years before they became widespread. Regarding his 1951 no-hitter, Feller said, quote, 
Jim Hegan called just about a perfect game, and I didn't have to shake him off once. Ray Boone, Bobby Avila, and Al Rosen, they all came through with beautiful plays. They said Feller and Cy Young at the time were the two players that had three no-hitters, and the record was broken by Sandy Koufax in the 1960s, who threw through four no-hitters, later by Nolan Ryan, who got seven. August 13th was Bob Feller night at the stadium. He got the key to the city from Cleveland Mayor Tom Burke, a silver tea set, a silver punch bowl, and his, with his teammates' signatures inscribed in the punch bowl. And the Cleveland baseball writers named him the man, 1951, the Tribe 1951 Man of the Year, Bob Feller. Bob Chacales was 3-4 and four with an ERA of 4.74, 17 games, 10 starts, 2 complete games, a shutout, 68 and a third innings pitched, and 32 strikeouts. Chacales batted 350 with 7 hits. He scored a run, had a home run, 6 RBIs, and 17 games. Chacales was born in 1927 in Asheville, North Carolina, and died in 2010 in Richmond, Virginia at age 82. For his career, he was 15-25 and 25 with an ERA of 4.54 and 187 strikeouts. Chicales played for the Cleveland Indians, Baltimore Orioles, Chicago White Sox, Washington Senators, and Boston Red Sox from 1951 to 1957. He was a starter, closer, and middle, closer and middle reliever. For his career, he had pitched in 171 games and had 23 starts, 3 complete games, a shutout, and 10 saves. Chicago Chicales and the Miners played for the Minneapolis Millers, Hawaii Islanders, San Francisco Seals, Utica Blue Sox, and the Wilmington Wilm, and for Wilmington. Bob Chicales. Lou Brissy was the closer for the tribe. He was four and three with an ERA of 3.20. 54 games, four starts, a complete game, nine saves, 112 and a third innings pitched and 50 strikeouts. Brissy batted 261 with six hits. He scored two runs, had a double, two RBIs in 54 games. Brissy was born in 1924 in Ware Shoals, South Carolina, and died in 2013 in Augusta, Georgia at age 89. For his career, he was 44 and 48 with an ERA of 4.07 and 436 strikeouts. He played for the Philadelphia Athletics and Cleveland Indians from 1947 to 1953. He was an All Star in 1949 with the Athletics. He was in the U.S. Army in the Second World War and saw heavy fighting in Italy in 1944. There was an artillery barrage he, was, he experienced on December 2, 1944, and the shell exploded and shattered his, light, his left tibia and shin bone in 30 pieces. The doctors wanted to amputate, but Brissy refused. He won a Purple Heart and a Bronze Star and American Campaign Medals. He had two years and 23 major operations for in his recovery before he returned to baseball wearing a metal brace on his leg. In 1948, he gave up Pat Seary's fourth home run in that four-home run game. After he retired, he was the national director of the American Legion Baseball and served as the pres- U.S. President's Physical, F- Physical Fitness Council. Later, in his later years, he, was, uh, he had crutches and was in constant pain. He frequently gave speeches to veterans of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. Lou Brissy. Steve Gromack was 7-4 with an ERA of 2.77, 27 games, 8 starts, 4 complete games, a save, 107 and a third innings, pitched in 40 strikeouts. Gromack batted 296 with 8 hits. He scored 2 runs at a double, 2 RBIs, 5 walks, and struck out 8 times. And Gromack was with Cleveland. From 1941 to 1953, Steve Gromack. George Zuverink had no decisions in an ERA of 5.33, 16 games, 25 and a third innings pitched, and 14 strikeouts. He did not bat. He was born in 1924 in Holland, Michigan, and died in 2014 in Tempe, Arizona at age 90. For his career, he was 32 and 36, with an ERA of 3.73 and 223 strikeouts. Zuverink pitched for the Cleveland Indians, Cincinnati Red Legs, Detroit Tigers, and Baltimore Orioles from 1951 to 1959. So he was a rookie in 1951. Mostly a, mostly a relief pitcher. 1957, Zuverink as a catcher and, uh, and Frank Zapp Zup as the pitcher formed the only Z battery in MLB history. Frank Zuppo. He died in 2014 after a fall that year in May when he had a fractured hip. Zuverink in the minor leagues played for the Fresno Cardinals, Spartanburg Peaches, Miami Marlins, and Vancouver Mounties. George Zuverink. 
Dick Rozek had no decisions in an ERA of 2.93. Seven games, a start, 15 and a third innings, pitched in five strikeouts. <coughs> he had one hit and three at-bats and struck out struck out twice, so batted 333. And Rozek was with Cleveland from 1950 to 1952. Dick Rozek. Jerry Farr had no decisions in an ERA of 4.76, five and two-thirds innings pitched. He did not bat. He was born in 1924 in Marmaduke, Arkansas, and died in 2010 in Duluth, Georgia, at age 85. His MLB career was just with the Cleveland Indians in 1951. He was in the minor leagues from 1947 to 1956. He played for the Vernon Dusters, Shreveport Sports, Ottawa Giants, Charleston Senators, Minneapolis Millers, Tulsa Oilers, Alexandria Aces, and Kilgore Drillers. Jerry Farr. Sam Jones was 0-1 with an ERA of 2.08, two games, a start, eight and two-thirds innings pitched, and four strikeouts. He batted twice, did not have a hit in two games. Jones was born in 1925 in Stewartsville, Ohio, and died in 1971 in Morgantown, West Virginia, at age 45. For his career, he, was 10, he won 102 games, lost 101 with an ERA of 3.59 and 1,376 strikeouts. He played in the Negro Leagues for the Cleveland Buckeyes from 1947 to 1948 and, and in MLB for the Cleveland Indians, Chicago Cubs, St. Louis Cardinals, San Francisco Giants, Detroit Tigers, and Baltimore Orioles from 1951 to 1964. Jones was a two-time All-Star in 1955 and 59. He was the National League wins leader in 1959. National League ERA leader as well that same year. Three-time National League strikeout leader, 1955-56. 6 and 58. He threw a no hitter in 1955 for the Cubs. Won a Negro American League title in 1947 with the Cleveland Buckeyes. He also played in Panama. 1952 with the Tribe pitching, with the Tribe, with Jones pitching and Quincy Troop catching. That was the first black battery in the American League history. Uh, and that was Quincy Troop had played for the Cleveland Buckeyes as well. Stan Musial said, quote, Sam had the best curveball I ever saw. He was quick and fast, and that curve was terrific. So big, it was like a change of pace. I've seen guys fall down on curves that became strikes. At the end of the, his no-header, he walked the bases loaded in the ninth, then struck out the side. 1959, he was the National League uh, pitcher, pitcher of the Year, uh, according to the Sporting News. He died of neck, neck cancer in 1964 and was diagnosed in 1962. Jones played in the minors for the Columbus Jets, Wilkes Bar Barons, and Atlanta Crackers, and in Puerto Rico for the Congrejeros de Santurce. Sam Jones. Bubba Harris had no decisions in an ERA of 4.50. Two games, <coughs> four innings pitched, and a strikeout. He did not bat. Harris was born in 1926 in Seligent, Alabama, and died in 2013 in Nobleton, Florida, at age 86. For his career, he was 6-3 with an ERA of 4.84 and 53 strikeouts. Harris played for the Philadelphia Athletics and Cleveland Indians from 1948 to 1951. So this was the end of his playing MLB career. In the minor leagues, he played for the Roanoke Red Sox, Geneva Redbirds, Gadsden Pilots, Aniston Rams, Lincoln A's, Birmingham and the Birmingham Barons, and the and in Cuba he played for the Havana Sugar Kings. Bubba Harris, and finally Johnny Vandermeer was 0-1 with an ERA of 18.00, one game which was a start, three innings pitched, six earned runs allowed, two strikeouts. He had one at bat and did not get a hit. Vandermeer was born in 1914 in Prospect Park, New Jersey, and died in 1997 in Tampa, Florida, at age 82. During his playing career, he won 119 games, lost 121 with an ERA of 3.44 and 1,294 strikeouts. Vandermeer, Vandermeer played for the Cincinnati Reds, Chicago Cubs, and Cleveland Indians between 1937 and 1951. So this was the end of his MLB career. He was a four-time All-Star in 1938, 39, 42, and 43. He won a World Series title in 1940 with the Cincinnati Reds. Three-time three-time National League strikeout leader from 1941 to 43. Vandermeer is mostly known for throwing two consecutive no-hitters in 1938. That's the only time that's happened in MLB history. He's in the Cincinnati Reds Hall of Fame. In the Second World War, he was in the U.S. Navy. 1952, in the minors, he threw a no-hitter for the Tulsa Oilers. 
After he retired, he was a minor, manager in the miners for the, in the red system for 10 years, also worked for a brewing company, and died of an abdominal aneurysm at home at age 82. The miners he played for the Dayton Ducks, Durham Bulls, and Oakland Oaks, Johnny Vandermeer. After the regular season, the uh, uh, World Series was played. The American League champions, New York Yankees, defeated the National League champions, New York Giants, four games to two. And the Giants had won a pennant after a three-game playoff with the Brooklyn Dodgers, which ended <coughs> with Bobby Thompson's home run, the so-called shot heard round the world. Hall of Famers in the World Series included umpire Al Barlick for the Yankees, Casey Stengel, manager, along with Bill, Bill Dickey, coach, and players Yogi Berra, Joe DiMaggio, Mickey Mantle, Johnny Mize, and Phil Rizzuto. And for the Giants, manager Leo DeRocher and players Monte Irvin and Willie Mays. This was the last World Series Joe DiMaggio played in. Retired after the, after the series. Uh, Rookies Willie Mays and Mickey Mantle, was, this was their first World Series. Roger Kahn wrote, quote, The National League pennant race of 1951 belongs to the ages. There has been nothing like it before or since, <coughs> nor will it come again. <coughs> summarizing the 1951 race is akin to summarizing King Lear. Before anything else, your effort will diminish majesty. On August 11th, the Giants were 13 games behind the Dodgers. October 3rd was the last of the three-game playoffs between the Giants and Dodgers at the Polo Grounds in New York City. Roger Kahn wrote, quote, Bobby Thompson's home run instantly became a moment in the consciousness of a nation without equal in American sport. The 1951 World Series was the first televised coast-to-coast. Mel Allen and Jim Britt were the broadcasters on television. Game 1 of the World Series, Monty Irvin, who had been a Negro League star, was a star in that game, with, had four hits and stole home in the first inning. The Giants won 5-1. to one. <coughs> Game 2 of the series, the Yankees had Joe DiMaggio in center and Mickey Mantle in right field. There was a fly ball to right center, and uh, Mantle went over to make the play. Uh, D- DiMaggio said, quote, I got it. Mantle stopped, had to stop quickly, quickly lost his footing, fell down, and had, had a severe knee injury. And he lost his tremendous speed. This was a real tragic thing for Mickey Mantle. Mantle said, quote, DiMaggio always wanted to look good out there. That was very important to him. So we waited to call Willie's fly until he was damn sure he could reach it in stride. That's why I had to stop so short. If DiMaggio called for it earlier, or if DiMaggio had backed off and let me take it, I don't believe I would have hurt my knee. Damn. He also, during that play, he caught his foot in a drain cover, was carried on a stretcher off the field, and missed the rest of the World Series. Game three was at the Polo polo Grounds. There was a play at second base, and Giants runner Eddie Stanky kicked the ball out of Phil Rizzuto's glove and was safe. Giants won that game 6-2. Leo DeRocher said, quote, It ain't a tea party out there, not against my guys. So DiMaggio retired in in December of... December 11th, DiMaggio announced his retirement and said, quote, I can no longer produce for my ball club, my manager, my teammates, and my fans, the sort of baseball their loyalty to me deserves. And then he began to weep. Roger Kahn wrote, quote, Jolton Joe was history. 1954, DiMaggio married Marilyn Monroe. And there's the, fam- the Simon and Garfunkel movie, What's That You Say, Mrs. Robinson? Jolton Joe has left and gone away. Hey, 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 hey. That was played in the 1967 movie, The Graduate. <coughs> now, back to the National League pennant race. <coughs> the Giants went 37-7 and to end the 51 season. The Bobby Thompson home run in that uh, playoff, Roy Campanella, the catcher for the Dodgers, said, quote, Never before or since have I seen such a, co- a commotion on a ball f- field. The Giants went wild with joy. By the time Bobby Thompson crossed the plate, thousands of fans had poured onto the field. Our guys just stood, dumbfounded. New York had three teams that finished in first place in 1951. All three teams, Yankees, Giants, and Dodgers. Thompson's home run was called the Miracle of Coogan's Bluff. Broadcaster Russ Hodges, the radio broadcaster, said... After the home run, he said, The Giants win the pennant! The Giants win the pennant! The Giants win the pennant! Bob Kuzava, a former tribe player, uh, was a 
Game six of the World, now back to the World Series. And Game six got the last three outs to win the World Series. Again, uh, Mickey Mantle was in the hospital uh, after getting hurt, and he shared a room with his father, uh, Mutt, Mutt, who they learned had cancer and died the following year. Casey Stengel had no children. Stengel and Mantle had a father-son relationship. Now, uh, after Joe DiMaggio retired, Casey Stengel said, quote, Joe DiMaggio was the greatest player I ever managed. Joe would charge out on the field after the Star Spangled Banner, and his teammates would charge after him, and I knew I had a leader. Now, Ralph Branca was the Dodger pitcher who gave up the National League, the National League title losing home run to Bobby Thompson, and Branca said, quote, I was feeling that I cost the team the pennant. We were going to get in the World Series, a chance to win, a chance for glory. You're thinking about wearing the World Series championship ring, and then it was all gone. Baseball is a game where you've got to learn how to win, and you've got to learn how to lose. You win graciously, and you lose graciously. Now, this Catholic priest, after the game, Father Pat Rowley said to Branca, quote, God chose you because he knew your faith would be strong enough to bear this cross. Branca said, quote, I don't want to live on that moment. It defines my whole career. Now back to the World Series, the Yankees, for the Yankees, DiMaggio was struggling playing center field. This was the end of his career. And Stengel had set, had set to Mantle, quote, take everything you can get over in center. In center. Uh, the, the, day goes, the day goes heel is hurting pretty bad. Mantle's father, Mutt, was at the World Series. And after this, uh, he had that severe injury on right center. Uh, when Mantle went to the hospital. His father also checked into the hospital, and uh, they shared a room, and, and the news came that his father had cancer, was dying of Hodgkin's disease. And so, and the doctor told Mickey Mantle, your father is dying. Tragic. Now back to the Dodgers, giant playoff game against the Yankees. Uh, or, or before, the, during, the, during that time, before the playoff in the World Series, the greatest television buying spree happened as people were buying TVs to watch the playoff and the World Series. Game three of the Dodgers-Giants, there were 16 million viewers, most ever for a baseball game. Jackie Gleason, Frank Sinatra, and Toot Shore were all at game three and saw the Bobby Thompson home run. Uh, a sports writer had this to say about Bobby Thompson's home run, quote, now it is done. Now the story ends, <coughs> and there's no way to tell it. <coughs> the art of fiction is dead. Reality has strangled invention. Only the utterly impossible, the inexpressibly fantastic, can ever be plausible again. And in the World Series, the Giants had the first black Outfield in MLB history, Hank Thompson, Willie Mays, and Monte Irvin. Mays was the 1951 National League Rookie of the Year. James Ash Hurst wrote, A new era had begun, and while the black ball players had raised the level of the game, Willie Mays would define it. I read a fine book. The title is A Moment in Time by Ralph, Ralph Bronca, the Brooklyn Dodger great who gave up Bobby Thompson's shot heard round the world with David Ritz, 2011. An American story of baseball, heartbreak, and grace. Bronk at age 10 uh, in 1936 was a New York Giants fan, went to a game with his family at the Polo Grounds, and he said, quote, I dreamed the dream, the eternal American dream, dreamed by millions, that one day I'd be on that field. I'd get to run on that grass. I'd get to take that mound. Now at Ebbets Field, there was a, Ebbets Field, there was a Schaefer beer score, scoreboard, uh, and uh, if... if if batter had a hit, the uh, the H in Schaefer would light. If it was an error, the E in Schaefer would light. There was also a, a sign that said, Hit, sign, win, suit. Ralph Branca said, quote, Any athlete worth his or her weight in salt is comforted by past accomplishments. Athletic achievements are often elusive and almost always hard-earned. We want to remember them with exclamation points. Branca continued, quote, it's amazing how an encouraging word can boost a pitcher's morale. After the Thompson home run, Brankus said, quote, We had the game cinched, and I blew it. I couldn't forgive myself. I would never forgive myself. I wanted to die. I kept reliving the, that pitch. I figured that eventually talk of October 3rd would diminish. I figured wrong. At home at night, I still had nightmares about that pitch. Now, Brank eventually uh, came to terms with... Uh, 
with uh, giving up that home run and, and had peace of mind. And he said, quote, God has been good to me. He has given me a long life and good health. I was blessed to be able to play in the big leagues. I was blessed to be a member of the Brooklyn Dodgers. The darkness of that day, October 3rd, 1951, has been overwhelmed by a life filled with light. Now, in 2012, they had a movie that came out called Parental Guidance with Billy Crystal, in which this, it's a beautiful movie at the end. Uh, Billy Crystal teaches his grandson that this uh, radio broadcast about the Giants win the pennant, and then his grandson at this uh, talent show recites it out loud. It's very, very touching. And now the uh, MVPs for the American League included Yogi Berra for the New York Yankees, and in the National League, Roy Campanella for the Brooklyn Dodgers. So that's the story of the 1951 Cleveland Indians. What a year. Rookie years for Mickey Mantle and Willie Mays and the Bobby Thompson home run. God bless the guys who played for the Cleveland Indians in 1951 and everyone else associated with the team, including the fans, especially the Civil War, the uh, First World War veterans, Second World War veterans, and Korean War veterans. Captains of the Cuyahoga, lovers of Lake Erie, Terminal Tower Power, fans of the Free Stamp Statue, and the Fountain of Eternal Life, Euclid Avenue Electricity, Severance Hall Stalwarts, Cleveland Museum of Art Enthusiasts, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum Rebels, Christmas Story House Happy People, Museum of Contemporary Art Maniacs, Cleveland Botanical Garden Goers, Old Arcade Admirers, Playhouse Square Seers, <coughs> Settlers Landing Park Purists, Western Reserve Historical Society Wonders, First Energy Stadium Friends, Progressive Field Pals, Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse Renegades, <coughs> Cuyahoga Valley National Park Pioneers, and Great Lakes Science Center Supporters. Tribe, Browns, Cavs, Monsters, Gladiators, and Fusion Rule, Cleveland City of Champions. Cleveland is the best location in the nation on the north coast of America. New York is the Big Apple. Cleveland is a plum. It's been 71 years since 1948. This is our year. Go Tribe. Tribe's having a good year. You might consider checking out our website, Adventures in History, with Peter J. Ray at peterjray.com. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. God bless you. Take care. And I'll see you next time.